they've given me 12 minutes, um, so this is going to be one of the fastest introductions to Kenevin that I've ever done. How many people have heard of Kenevin? Keep your hands up if it was me that taught you. Keep your hands up if you're now teaching other people. A, a little bit, okay. Um, this is one of my favorite things in the world. So basically, Kenevin is a framework for making sense of different situations and how to approach them depending on how certain or uncertain the situation is. And it, ha it deals with uncertainty. That's a book on uncertainty. It says on chapter one, uh, if project has no risk, don't do it. And that's because every piece of software has risks inherent in it. If it didn't, we would be doing the same thing again with the same team, same requirements again, okay? So I'm going to show you why um, lots of people assume that there is predictability in software development and they behave as if there's predictability and you can't get it. I'm going to skip this bit. Uh, this is how you get innovation. Right, let's get straight on to the meat of it. All right. So there's five domains in Kenevin. The borders are fuzzy. You just saw there's a little loop. That's a dynamic you see in Kenevin. Um, there's four domains, one in the middle. So the first domain is the obvious domain. And obvious problems are either ones which children can solve, or if uh, it does require expertise, the solution's still obvious. So I go to my landlady, I go, what do you do when the beer runs out? And she says, well, I change the barrel, obviously, duh. Now, I don't know how to change a barrel, but it's obvious to me that that would be the solution. And those kind of problems, you can categorize them. You can go, oh, it's one of those problems. OK. So as things become more and more complicated, um, they require more and more expertise. So a watchmaker knows how to fix a watch. A car mechanic knows how to fix your car. And cause and effect are correlated with expertise. OK, so they're correlated, obviously, down here with expertise up here. Uh, and you can analyze the problem. You can go, oh, it's one of those problems if you've got the right expertise. OK, the problem is down here in the chaotic domain. Chaos is accident and emergency. Chaos is your house burning down. Chaos is the reason why we have an innate fear of uncertainty, because it's normally regarded as a really bad place to be. It is also the domain of urgent opportunity, but it's a transient domain. It will resolve itself quickly and not necessarily in your favor. And in chaos, you have to act, and you have to act really fast. The problem comes with this domain up here, the complex domain. Because we have this innate fear of uncertainty, we tend to try and get predictability. And confirmation bias kicks in, and then we pretend we've got predictability even when we don't. So in the complex domain, um, cause and effect are only correlated with hindsight. You can see how you got there, but you couldn't possibly have predicted it. So as an example, there's a company called Ludicourt. They had this big online game called NeverEnding, and they wanted to get people to play this game. So they said, we'll set up a site where people can share screenshots of the game. And they set up the tools, and people started using them. Very pretty. Lots of lovely, engaged players. And then people started sharing their photos, landscapes, their families, holiday snaps. And that became Flickr. And you can see in retrospect how it happened, but you couldn't possibly have predicted it. So this, those of you who are working on Agile projects, hands up if you're not on a project that's remotely Agile. Oh, you're all such lucky people. You're all used to seeing this. You're used to seeing outcomes that emerge, OK? In the middle, we have disorder. And disorder is a domain where we don't know which of these dominates, so we behave according to our preferred domain. So put your hands up if you've ever been asked for an estimate in time or money for something you've never, ever done before. Keep your hands up if you gave an estimate. And keep your hands up if that got treated as a promise or a commitment. Right? That's disorder. That's treating complexity as if it's predictable. And all those big plans that people come up with, all those divisions of story cards into tiny little pieces, even on Agile projects, right? 624.5 story points. I've been on that project. It was awful. It's just Waterfall by another name. And Waterfall pretended that software was predictable, and it turned out not to be. The reason this is important for you is that if you can't predict an outcome, it's going to be very hard to do BDD. And you're going to find it hard with the stuff that's new, because that's where you're going to be making discoveries. That's where the complexity is greatest. So you can use the examples to explore and have conversations. And that's really great. And that's why having the conversations about the new stuff, which is also where the value is, because that's, it's where the risk is, it's where the value is, having the conversations is the most important part of BDD. 
And if you can focus on having the conversations and spiking some stuff out and trying it until you have the understanding, and then because none of you are brilliant at refactoring, um, I'm assuming that's the case. I'm not brilliant at refactoring. I flip and love it. Rewrite your prototype, OK? Uh, and do it with the scenarios automated if you can. And, and then you'll have that living, lovely living documentation. But BDD works really, really well in the complicated domain. Not so well in the complex domain, though you can explore using examples. And people are going to get bored if you use it in the obvious domain. So just name the scenarios and be done with them. You should be using something off the shelf or something open source in that space anyway. And that's Kenevin, and that's why it's relevant to BDD. Thank you very much. Wow. Thanks, Liz. 12 minutes is not a long time, is it? How did I do? That was six. It was six. Excellent. So you can ask me questions then if you want to. Okay. Let me come back up. That was really was the fastest. I, I didn't get a lot of time to prepare, I'll tell you that. Um, any, are there any questions? You all just had your minds blown. You're going to go out there and be spotting disorder left, right, and center. Yes? Where did the name Kenevin come from? Uh, it was Dave Snowden is the guy who created it. He's Welsh. It's a Welsh word. Um, it's pronounced like Kevin with an un, so now you'll remember. It's Kenevin. Uh, it means a place, but it's also got a sense of belonging and a flow through history. And when I asked him, he told this story about sheep and how you know the, the shepherd takes the sheep out to where they're going to graze, and then he brings them back, and then he takes them out and he brings them back. And after a couple of years of doing that, he just needs to let them out the gate, and they'll go themselves and they'll take the next lot of sheep with them. And the sheep grow up knowing that that's their place. That was the story he told me. So, anything else? How do you sell Kenevin to leaders? How do I sell Kenevin to leaders? Uh, they love the word risk. Um, they really like talking about risk and um, have, telling them you're going to give them a tool for helping to navigate uncertainty and uh, helping drive transformation and change. It's, it, it's really good. Um, I found it my single best tool for actually talking to leadership. I mean, it was originally introduced in an article in Harvard Business Review called A Leader's Framework for Decision Making. So it helps people make the right decision. Um, I should have said, actually, I completely missed the thing that you do in complexity is called probe. So that trying something out that's safe to fail. Um, that's the... the there's a lot of things around probe design and I'm hoping I might get a chance to talk through at some point, maybe uh, in the open space. Anything else? Yep. Um, do you have an example of something that's complicated versus complex? Um, yeah. So how would you um, recognize So I wrote a whole blog post called Disorder or How I Got a Black Eye. Um, so normally we see complexity treated as complicated, but it is possible to do it the other way around. So being a dev, I really like the complex space and I hate reading instructions. And I had this big green screen that you have to fold up and put away. So this thing comes in a little circular container like this. When you open it out, it pops out with this wooden springy frame into something that's not dissimilar to this size. And then you have to fold this thing to get it back into its round container. And there's, if you look it up on YouTube, there's videos of people doing what they call the green screen dance, where you have to, oh, sorry. Um, I'll just pop that there. Uh, the green screen dance, where you kind of, you have to squeeze this thing, and ah, uh, and there's all these people trying to work out how to do it. And I watched one of these videos with these guys having a bit of a laugh doing it, and they were all doing the green screen dance and failing. And I thought, well, OK, I can give it a try then, too. So I treated it like something which was complex. The problem was it wasn't actually safe to fail. I let go of one end, and it popped in, flew, and hit me in the face. And you know, I was lucky it just knocked my glasses off. Um, so that's an example of the difference. Complicated stuff is mechanical frequently. Um, it has instructions. You can learn the expertise. So if you have no expertise, you end up treating it as complex. And you should try not to do that with stuff that's not safe to fail, right? Because then you can't. And you'll end up in chaos like I did. Um, somebody asked me whether a, uh, I asked whether a football game was complex or not once when I was doing a workshop. And somebody said, is England playing? 
Like, okay, just because England playing does not make it predictable, if it's got a predictable outcome, it's probably complicated. Otherwise, it's dispositional rather than predictable. So England are disposed to lose, but com football games are still complex and punctuated by moments of chaos when you know, they're approaching the goal. So there you go. Does that help? Anything else? Very quickly. Last one. No. Oh, at the back. Oh, I'm going to come with the, with the mic for you. Thank you. Is there a litmus test, a uh, set of questions that leaders can ask to know for certain which quadrant of Kinefin they're in? Uh, please, if you call them quadrants, Dave Snowden kills puppies. He likes kittens too much. Um, Somebody once said they're domain look, 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 more like spaces, fuzzy, and there's five of them. Um, so it's a, a way of knowing. I always ask, is it new? Can you get expertise on it? Um, so if you say, who in the world's ever done this before? If nobody's done it, or nobody's done it within your organization, your context, it's going to be complex. Um, if somebody's done it before, you have access to expertise, it's going to be complicated. So you can learn how to do it, or you can, and that's perfect BDD territory. Ask them for an example, gain that expertise yourself. Um, as, as you start moving to, yeah, we all know how to do it. People in our team know how to do it. We all know how to do it. You're starting to move into the obvious domain. Chaos, we kind of know, because everybody's running around like headless chickens going, oh, my God. Um, we know when we're in chaos. Cool. Thank you very much, all. Cheers. <laughs>